So in 5.4, we're going to be talking about the indefinite integral. So in the first three sections, we talked about the definite integral. And the definite integral represented a number. And that number was the area underneath the curve between A and B. And we defined the area to be positive if it was above the x-axis. And we defined the area to be negative if it was below the x-axis. So the indefinite integral is going to be a little bit different. So the indefinite integral is a function transformation. And it is the inverse of the transformation that is the derivative. So we know, for example, that the derivative d dx of x squared is equal to 2x. So if we think of this as our domain, and then over here we have our range. If I had the function x squared, it would get mapped to its derivative. So this is our derivative. And we could have a whole bunch of other functions, right? So if I had something like sine, we know that it would get mapped to its derivative, which is cosine. So the derivative was a function that took another function and gave us back yet a third function. So we input a function and we output another function. So the name of that type of function, a function that takes a function as an input, is called an operator. So we operate on some function and it gives us back another function. So in terms of what we have here, we have that the derivative transforms x squared into 2x. And if we name the operator D, which we didn't have a lot of time to work with Maple this semester, but D it works as the derivative operator in Maple. And it transforms x squared into 2x. So if the function D of f takes the derivative of f, then D of x squared would give us 2x. The inverse of D would be the indefinite integral. So D inverse of 2x would give us the antiderivative x squared plus an arbitrary constant. And we will write the integral of 2x dx equals x squared plus c. So it's worth noting a couple of things that are different about this indefinite integral. So the first thing we want to note is there are no limits of integration. So when we had a definite integral, we had numbers on the top and the bottom. And the second thing we'll notice is when we take the indefinite integral, both the integral symbol and the differential disappear as a pair. So what these things will always be a pair. You cannot have one without the other. You can't have an integral symbol without a differential, and you can't have the differential without the integral symbol. So when we're taking these integrals, we always have to have both. And just like when we were doing antiderivatives, an indefinite integral will always have a, an arbitrary constant of integration. So we mentioned it last time, and it's going to be useful again. So in the blank lecture notes, there is another sheet that was just titled integrals that looks like this. And it has our derivatives in one column and then the indefinite integral in another column. 
for a bunch of our common functions. And that'll be helpful as we move forward. All right, so let's take a look at our first example. So we're asked to evaluate the indefinite integral. And so notice I have the indefinite part in parentheses. So oftentimes, especially when people are speaking, they will omit the indefinite part. So it's very common for people to write and say, just find the integral and we have to derive the context based on whether or not we have limits of integration or not. So people aren't going to say definite integral versus indefinite integral. They'll just say integral. And we know that this is an indefinite integral because I have no limits of integration. So if we think back to 5.2, we had some properties of integrals. So we know that the sum and the difference of an integrand is the same as the integral of the sum and the difference. So this would be the same as the integral of x dx minus the integral of sine x dx. So we can break the integral up into two separate parts and then just do each of them separately. So this is the same thing that we could do with derivatives, which is we can just differentiate each part separately the same is true for sums and differences of integrals. So if we look at our antiderivative rules, the antiderivative of x to the n, so the derivative of x to the n is we multiply by the exponent and subtract 1. Well, the integral is the inverse or the opposite, so we add 1 to the exponent and then divide by the exponent plus c. So the antiderivative of x squared is going to be 1 half x squared because dividing by 2 is the same as multiplying by 1 half minus and then the antiderivative of sine is going to be negative cosine so the minus minus is going to end up making that a plus and then we have plus c so simplifying all of that we have 1 half x squared plus cosine x plus c. And it's worth noting, since we know derivatives and integrals are inverses of each other, if we take the derivative, we should get the original function back. So note, since derivatives and integrals are inverses, the derivative of the integral should give back the original function. So let's just check. So if we take the derivative of 1 half x squared, well, that's 1 half. The derivative of x squared is 2x plus the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And the derivative of a constant is 0. So the 1 half and the 2 reduce out, and we get x minus sine x which was exactly what we had as our original function. So we can always check that our integral is correct by taking the derivative if we wish. All right, so let's take a look at our next example. And I have a typo here. I did not put the integral symbol on, so let's make sure that we add that. So for b, we can't have the differential without the integral. So we have our integral 
of 7x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 1. If we wanted to be very formal like we did up here, we could rewrite it as this time 1, 2, 3 separate integrals. So if we wished, we could rewrite this as the integral of 7x to the fourth dx plus, sorry, minus the integral of 3x squared dx plus the integral of 1 dx. Furthermore, we had our property in 5.2 that says we can pull constants out of integrals. So if we wanted to, we could further rewrite this as 7 times the integral of x to the fourth dx minus 3 times the integral of x squared dx plus pulling the 1 out 1 times anything is just the anything so we'll get this and it's worth noting that 1 dx will write as just dx and we know that there is a 1 there if we need it so a couple of comments we didn't have to do all of this piecewise. If you wanted to split this up, you could have just pulled the seven out at the same time you were splitting it up and went directly from this to this. And once again, this is a formality and it doesn't have to be done. But now when I look at x to the fourth, what's the antiderivative of x to the fourth? Well, I add one to the exponent and divide by it. So I'm gonna have seven times x to the fifth over five minus three, and then the antiderivative of x squared is, I add one to the exponent and divide by it, so x cubed over three, and then the antiderivative of one, or the antiderivative of dx, is going to be x, because the derivative of x would give me one plus c. Now we simplify things up a bit, our threes reduce out, and we end up with 7 fifths x to the fifth minus x cubed plus x plus c. So that would be our indefinite integral of our example. All right, so now it is your turn. I very much would like you guys to go ahead and find the integral of 10x to the fourth minus two secant squared x dx. So to find our integral, we're going to look at our first one. So we have x to the fourth, so we're gonna add one to our exponent and divide by it. So that's going to give us 10x to the fifth over five minus two, and then the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent plus a constant, and then we simplify things up. 10 divided by five gives us two, x to the fifth minus two tangent x plus c. So our indefinite integral would be two x to the fifth minus two tan x plus c. Professor, I have a question. Can you hear? All right, so let's take a look at our next example. So we have the integral of sine theta over cosine squared theta d theta. And we're looking at that and we're like, dang, that does not look like anything that is on our integral sheet. So similar to when we were doing derivatives, we may need to use algebra to simplify.
So in this case, we know that sine divided by cosine is going to be tangent, and then that would leave a, another cosine in the denominator. So using some trig, we have sine over cosine is tangent theta, and one over cosine is secant theta, d theta. So then we go looking at our integral sheet, and as we get down here a little bit, we notice we have a secant tangent right here, and the integral of secant tangent is going to be secant. So the integral of secant tangent is going to be secant, so we get secant theta plus c. So just be aware that sometimes we need to do a little bit of algebra before we can take our integral. All right. So now the next thing we want to look at is called the net change theorem. And it is a consequence of the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. But if we think of it in terms of rates of change in physics, it really makes a lot of sense. So let's talk a little bit about the net change theorem. So the net change theorem says the integral of a rate of change, and remember a rate of change is a derivative, is the net change. So if we take the definite integral from a to b of f prime of x dx by the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, we know that that is f of b minus f of a. Well, that represents the net change. So if f prime of t represents the rate at which water is being rela released from a dam with units cubic meters per minute, then df dt, that's our derivative, is the change in volume over the change in time, which is the change in volume per hour. So if we integrate the change in volume per hour with respect to time, it gives us volume. There really should be a period there. Um, so it is the volume of water released between times t equals a and t equals b. So look at it this way. If you know how much water is coming out at each second, so no matter what it was, if we were to look at it, the simplest case, so here's time and here's volume per hour. If it were constant, so let's say it was 30 cubic meters per minute. And if we had that released at that rate for two hours, sorry, if I'm gonna do hours down here, I should do hours up here. So 30 cubic meters per hour, well then how much water would have been released in two hours? Well, if I have 30 cubic meters per hour times two hours, it would be 30 times two would give me 60, which would be the area of that rectangle, right? So if we have a constant rate of change, it's easy because we can figure out what the area of that rectangle is. But now imagine, instead of having a constant rate of change, what if the rate of change of water looked something like this? Well then the amount of water that came out would still be the area, but we wouldn't be able to approximate it with a simple multiplication problem. We would have to do a Riemann sum, and then that Riemann sum would give us an integral and the integral would give us the exact area underneath the curve. So this allows us to find out exactly how much water came out if we know what the rate of change is. And if you think about almost anything, they don't turn, they don't open up a dam instantly to flow out that much water. It opens up slowly. The rate of water increases until it reaches some capacity, 
And even at that capacity, it's not going to be constant. It's going to fluctuate up and down depending on what's happening. And as long as you know what that rate is, we can integrate to figure out how much water was released. We'll do a couple of examples to help illustrate this idea. So example number two. says, in a chemical reaction, NaCl, or sodium chloride, is formed at a rate of 1 divided by T squared plus 1 milligrams per second. How much sodium chloride is formed in the first 3 seconds of this reaction? So, in chemistry, when you mix reactants, at the very beginning, there's going to be a lot of sodium and a lot of chlorine. So there's going to be lots of, in, lots of interactions. And so the salt will be formed much more quickly. But as the longer that reaction goes on, those reactants are going to become depleted and less and less common. So then the reaction slows down until it get, reaches equilibrium which is where it no longer forms any new reactants. So knowing how fast things react with each other is important if we want to know the total amount formed in any amount of time. So this represents our rate right here. So if we want to find out the total amount formed in the first three seconds, we are going to take the integral from zero to three of the rate dt. So in this case, that's going to be the integral from 0 to 3 of 1 over t squared plus 1 dt. And that will tell us the amount of sodium chloride formed in the first three seconds of that reaction. Okay, so we look at our integral sheet and we find the integral of 1 over 1 plus t squared, well that's going to be right here, and 1 over x squared plus 1 dx has integral inverse tangent of x. So this is going to be the inverse tangent of x evaluated from 0 to 3. So that gives us the inverse tangent of 3 minus the inverse tangent of 0. And the inverse tangent of zero is zero. So the exact answer is the inverse tangent of three. So we can approximate that by taking the inverse tangent of three, and that gives us 1.249 So rounding to two decimal places, we would get that it is approximately 1.25 milligrams. All right, so the next one I believe is for you guys. It is a U try. Oh, but before we do that, let's go ahead and graph um, one over x squared plus one. And let's change our window. So let's make our x min zero. And let's make our x max. 3, and then let's scale it in point 2's, and let's make our y min 0, we'll make our y max 1, and let's go ahead and scale this in point 2's as well. So if we look at the graph of 
this is 1 over t squared plus 1, we'll notice at the very, very beginning, the reaction happens very, very fast. But as time goes on, in fact, when we get down to at 3 seconds, we'll notice that if we do r of 0, r of 0 is 1 over 0 squared plus 1 equals 1. And if we do r of 3, we get 1 over 3 squared plus 1. 3 squared is 9 plus 1 is 10, gives us 1 over 10. So instantaneously, when the reaction started, it was making instantaneously 1 milligram of salt per second. But by the time it had made it to the end of that, it had slowed down to where it was making 1 tenth of a milligram per second. And the longer time goes on, the closer and closer that gets to zero. So our reaction kept slowing down. So if we looked at this in terms of our integral, we'll see the reaction was really fast here, and it tapered off close to zero as that reaction approached equilibrium. All right, so now it's time for your U try. So your U try reads as follows. It says, oil is leaking from a pipe at a rate of 2 plus 2 sine t liters per hour. How much oil will leak out in 6 hours? Round to the nearest tenth of a liter. All right, so before we work this example, let's go ahead and draw a graph of... our rate function. So this time we have 2 plus 2 sine x. Make sure I'm in radians. I am. So then let's go ahead and change our window. And let's have our x max still be, or x min still be 0. We'll make our x max 6. And we can leave our scaling at 0.2. We'll make our y min 0. Let's make our y max 4 in this case. And then we'll still leave it scaled as point twos. So when we look at this graph, we notice that the rate at which um, the water is, or the oil is leaking out of the pipe isn't constant. So at the very, very beginning, it looks like the oil is leaking out at a rate of two liters per hour, but then it increases to right here to four liters per hour, and then it looks like they get it stopped instantaneously, but then it starts leaking again, right? So we want to know how much oil leaked out during that six hours. So then we would have to do the integral from zero to six of our rate, which is two plus two sine t dt. So we take our antiderivative and the antiderivative of two is two t. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, so we get negative two cosine t, and then we evaluate that from zero to six, and that's going to give us two times six minus two times the cosine of six minus two times zero minus two times the cosine of zero. And we start simplifying, so we have 12 minus 2 cosine 6. Anything times 0 is 0, so this guy is going to be 0. And the cosine of 0 is 1. 
So we get minus, and then two, one times negative two is negative two. So minus a minus makes that plus positive. So then we end up with 14 minus two times the cosine of six. And if we want an approximation of that, we would go 14 minus two times the cosine of six. And we get about 12.08 if we round to two decimal places liters. So, one thing that is nice that we can do on our calculator, after we found the antiderivative, if you just go and put your antiderivative in, we would have 2x minus 2 cosine x. And we now have that in y1. So if I just go alpha trace, grab my y1, I go y of 6 minus alpha trace y of 0, our calculator will do all of that arithmetic for us. And there's no reason for us to do any of that by hand. So after you've done the calculus and found the antiderivative, by all means outsource the arithmetic to your calculator to get the approximation. Some problems will ask for exact answers. So if there's things like pies floating around, you'll have to resort to doing the actual arithmetic. But most of the time you'll be able to just approximate doing something like this. All right, let's take a look at our next example. So we have a particle travels along a line, which its fancy name for traveling along a straight line is called rectilinear motion, with an acceleration of 2t minus 1 meters per second squared, and an initial velocity v of 0 equals negative 6 meters per second. So a, we wish to find the velocity function at time t, find the total displacement from zero to five seconds, and C, find the total distance traveled in five seconds. So before we start doing this, well, there's a couple of things we wanna remind ourselves of. So if we have a function f of t that represents position what does f prime of t represent? Well, the derivative of position is velocity. And then if we take another derivative, the derivative of velocity, so f double prime of t is acceleration. So those were our properties for derivatives. The derivative of position is velocity and the derivative of velocity is acceleration. But now that we know derivatives and integrals undo each other then, that would tell us then that the integral of the acceleration function is going to be velocity. And the integral of the velocity function would then give us position. So derivative of position is velocity, derivative of velocity, acceleration. So since derivatives and integrals undo each other, if we integrate acceleration, we get back velocity. And if we integrate velocity, we will get back position. So now with this knowledge, we can do part A. So it says find the velocity v of t at time t. 
we know that our acceleration function is a equals 2t minus 1. So then our velocity is going to be equal to the integral of our acceleration function. And our acceleration function was 2t minus 1 dt. So our velocity v of t is equal to the antiderivative of 2t is going to be t squared. And the antiderivative or the integral of negative 1 is going to be t plus an arbitrary constant. Luckily, we were told that v of 0 has to be 6. So we can use the initial condition to solve for c. So this is exactly the same thing we did back in chapter 4 in the antiderivative section. So we know then that v of 0 is equal to negative 6, which is then equal to, we have 0 squared minus 0 plus c, which reduces the equation to negative 6. That 0 minus 0 equals c. So that tells us c is negative 6. So if we put our c back into, I shouldn't use red, I've already used red. If we put c back into our velocity function, we finally get that v of t, the total or the complete velocity function without any arbitrary constants is t squared minus t minus 6. All right, so that gives us the answer to part a. So now we want to find the total displacement from 0 to 5 seconds. So to find the total displacement, we're going to have to do something. But before we do that, let's look at part C as well. It says, find the total distance traveled in 5 seconds. So if, at first, we might be wondering, well, what's the difference between b and c? So let's draw a number line to help us visualize what's happening. So we're doing rectilinear motion, and we have distance or we have our velocity as a function of time. So if I were to graph my velocity function, let's see what we get. So I put in x squared minus x minus 6. And I'm going to go zoom 6 for standard. Brings me back to this. And we're really only concerned about 0 to 5. So let's change our window and just make our x min 0 and our x max 5. So if this represents my velocity function, right here, if this is my velocity function, It looks like for this part, I am below the horizontal axis. So my function is negative. So that means my velocity is negative here. And then after this point, my velocity changes from negative to positive. So what that would mean is on this first interval right here, when my velocity is negative, that means the particle is moving backwards. So if I imagine 0 is my starting point, 
while I have negative velocity, I'm going to be going backwards. And then at this point right here, my velocity is zero. Well, that would be a zero of the derivative. So that means my velocity is changing sign there. It's changing from negative to positive. So that means I'm turning around and then I'm going to go back in this direction so far. I mean, I don't know how far, but I'm going to go back in this direction. So parts B and part C are asking us two different things. So part B asks for the total displacement, which would be, if I stop here, the total displacement is the distance from where I started to where I stopped. So this is my total displacement. Whereas, so that's the answer to B. Part C wants the total distance traveled, which would be the distance I traveled backwards plus the distance I traveled forward. So let's go ahead and do B first. So it turns out B is the easy one because if we have area that is below the x-axis, this is going to be negative, and then our area above the x-axis is going to be positive. So then the value of the integral would be this area, the area in blue, minus the area in green, which is actually going to represent the total displacement. So for b, we would integrate from 0 to 5 our velocity function t squared minus t minus 6 dt, which would give us 1 third t cubed minus 1 half t squared minus 6t. And then we evaluate that from 0 to 5. So then that's going to be 1 third times 5 cubed minus 1 half times 5 squared minus 6 times 5 minus, and then all of the other ones are going to be 0 because 0 times anything is 0. So all of these guys together go to 0. And then that gives us, it's too early to do arithmetic, so we're going to have 5 cubed over 3 minus 5 squared over 2 minus 6 times 5. And we get negative 5 sixths. So that means that my picture here is kind of a lie. We started, we went backwards some distance and then we stopped and then we turned around and we came back and we stopped at negative 5 sixths. So we didn't quite make it back to where we started. So the total displacement from where we started was negative 5 sixths of a meter. But now we want the total distance well, to get the total distance, we don't want this to be negative. We want it to be positive. So we need to figure out, well, when does our velocity change from negative to positive? Or in other words, we need to find our critical point. So for C, we need to find our critical point. So that's T squared minus t minus 6 is equal to 0. And we factor, and that's going to give us minus 3 and plus 2. So our two critical numbers are negative 3 and t equals negative 2. This one is not in 0, 5, so we don't care about it. So we're only doing from 0 to 5. 
So as we probably could have guessed from our graph, our velocity is zero right here when t is equal to three. So then we know that the green integral, we don't want the negative of that. So we're going to have the negative of the integral from zero to three of t squared minus t minus six dt plus the integral from three to five of t squared minus t minus six dt. And this is because we don't want because we didn't want the negative area. So distributing the minus sign into our integral gives the integral from zero to three of negative t squared plus t plus six dt plus the integral from three to five of t squared minus t minus six dt. Taking our antiderivative, we get t cubed over, negative t cubed over three plus t squared over two plus 6t evaluated from 0 to 3 plus t cubed over 3 minus t squared over 2 minus 6t evaluated from 3 to 5. So now if I put each of these into my calculator, this as y1 and this as y2, I'm going to have y1 of 3 minus y1 of 0 plus y2 of 5 minus y2 of 3. So putting each of those in, I have my negative x cubed over 3 plus x squared over 2 plus 6x. And then I have um, x cubed over 3 minus x squared over 2 minus 6t and typing y3 minus y1 of 3 minus y1 of 0 and everything in we get 156 or 157 over 6. So then the total distance traveled would be 157 over 6 meters.